we're going to uh, we're going to talk about uh, collisions and momentum a little bit more today. Uh, we're going to review some homework, momentum homework. Um, and uh, there's there's going to be some homework uh, between now and Tuesday or now and Thursday uh, and hopefully it'll be a fairly small uh, and th actually there's going to be two homework assignments one really small that I'll talk about in a minute and another one fairly small uh, just a couple calculations uh, but before we do that I want to talk about the exams uh, for a few minutes in your grades page you now have three new rows uh, down in there somewhere and the first one is exam one Scantron so that's the number of dinero, the number of points that you got from your Scantron. Then the other one is exam one clicking. And that's the iClicker items from the last page, something out of five. Now, if you have a minus one there, that means we don't have any clicking data from you. If you have a minus one anywhere on the exam, uh, that means we don't have your data. All right. And if you have a zero, that means uh, we don't have you didn't earn anything you know so if you have a zero instead of minus one on the eye clicking uh, line of the grades page then it means uh, that uh, you clicked but you didn't get any points all right then the third line is the sum of the previous two uh, so scantron score plus eye clicking score something out of 50 all right so I just want to uh, reinforce that I had a few students ask me about it over the weekend and so uh, another thing I want to bring up to you uh, is your Scantron data sheet now in times past uh, we have printed out these Scantron data sheets uh, onto paper and then the first class back after you know after they give give us the printouts uh, my TAs and I hand them back. In a big class it like this, it takes a long time, even with two TAs plus me. Uh, but since I don't have any TAs this semester, uh, we're just going to do it uh, electronically. Um, I'll, I'll send them to you by PDF if you desire. Now, first thing I want to show you about this, if you haven't, uh, for you guys that are new here this semester, newbie freshmen, for those of you that haven't had a Scantron in a while, uh, the the printout like this, this is a student that messed up their PID. So I put a fake PID in there, 007, and a fake uh, serial number, 314. Uh, but that's a real student's data. And you can look at this, and first of all, you can see the total points up here in the upper right. So that just goes straight into your uh, grades page. That goes into the exam one Scantron line of the grades page, all right, straight in. So I don't multiply by two. I don't put in a percentage. Now this printout has a percentage on it. I never use that. I just use the points, all right? So the raw points, the raw score, and the uh, total points are the same in my class. Now you may have a, an instructor that does things differently over in the history department or music or something like that. Uh, but that's how I do it. Now let's take a little close up on this baby. Uh, there are four columns. There, actually there's two main columns. Each main column has four sub columns. The first one is the question number. Second one is, did you get it wrong? If there's nothing there, you got it right. If there's an X, you got it wrong. Now, when you look at yours, you'll see a few of them, like this student got number 40, incorrect. And the third column says what the student bubbled in. And the fourth column 
says what the actual correct answer was. Now, I always make, uh, before I send the exams over to be graded, I always take the exam myself and make sure the answer key is accurate. Now, every once in a while, I have a typo on the answer key, or I change something and I forget to change the key. And but then, So what I normally do is, after you guys take the test, sometimes before, I do the test, check the answer key. So the answer key is righteous. And so you can look at this one and say, well, number 40, the student answered B, but C was correct. Right, so you'll be able to look at all your errors in that way. The other thing is you'll be able to see um, if you uh, had any uh, blanks, because this will, if you, for, if you didn't bubble it in dark enough, or if uh, you, if you, uh, sometimes you, you uh, bubble in one and then erase it and then bubble in something else. Um, and, but the first one, you didn't erase it well enough. So now the Scantron machine thinks you got two dots and that's going to be wrong. Okay, so you could tell that from your printout as well. All right, and I can actually do that as well. So don't you worry about that. I'll, I'll get those fixed up for you. Uh, but if you do get it and you see blank or you see two dots, A and C or something like that, um, it'll have to be fixed. So that's, those are bloopers. Uh, and, and, so what I have now is I have a gigantic PDF file. One page of each PDF, uh, one page each is for each of you. And so I can look at your printout. Um, and what I can do is send it to you through the um, uh, web courses messaging system as a PDF file. In fact, I've already done it for one student and uh, that was, you know, asking me about it last night. So <coughs> this printout, is, I can give it to you as a PDF if you want. All right. And you'll be able to see, you know, what you're you know, which ones you got incorrect. Now, um, to, um, uh, to implement that strategy, uh, I've set up a homework uh, with one question. Do you want your exam one Scantron results PDF? Yes or no? Uh, it's homework zero, zero, exam one Scantron PDF. Um, and it's basically one question. Do you, do you want it? Yes or no? Do you not want it? No. And the way it works is it's not part of your semester grade. It's just my way of efficiently gathering the names of people that want their Scantron PDF. Okay. So I'll just look at the, the scores and I'll say everybody that's got a one. If you answer yes, that's the correct answer. You'll get one point. If you answer no, that's a zero. It's not right. But don't worry, it doesn't go into your grade. This one's just like a bookkeeping quiz. Kind of like the attendance quiz, you know, homework zero. That's why this one's zero, zero. Uh, so, it, so you answer whatever you want. If you want your PDF of your Scantron results, good. Answer yes. If you don't, you know, it's good. Whatever you want to do. All right. And I'll try to start getting those out. That's going to be a big job. I usually have TAs to do this, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll have to do it myself. So it might be a few weeks, but the thing is you won't need it until the end of the semester. And you may say to yourself, well, Dr. B, what good is a Scantron PDF? I know my score. Why do I need to know which questions I got wrong? Well, the reason is because I also provide a blurb sheet to go with your PDF, with your Scantron PDF. So the blurb sheet, let me focus in on it. This is, this is one from uh, exam one in uh, spring semester. You see those velocity diagrams there? See that? So you can look at your uh, blurb sheet and then look at your Scantron results PDF and you can say, oh, I got number 26 wrong. What was 26 about? The blurb sheet gives you a blurb for each question, except for the match, except for formula matching. Okay, so the matching, you don't get a blurb, but all the true-false, 
all the multiple choice, you get a little blurb about it. So like 26, yeah, 26, it says the correct answer was A for that test form. And every test form has a different blurb sheet, you know, different answer key. Okay. Uh, so for this test form, I don't know, this is form A. Uh, the, uh, the 26, the correct answer is A. You got it wrong. Your Scantron results PDF shows you that. And this tells you what it's about. Uh, in this case, no such thing as horizontal gravity. Remember that from the test? That was, on, that was the correct answer for one of the multiple choice, in fact. All right, so, so with your Scantron PDF and the blurb sheet, which I'll post in web courses, so this one's going to be the same for one-fourth of, of the class. And then uh, form B, the blurb sheet's going to look different. And that's going to be another fourth of the class, a form C and form D and so forth. All right, so, uh, so you'll be able to look at this with your Scantron results PDF and then get a good idea. Ooh, I got caught napping on a lot of uh, free fall concepts, like no such thing as horizontal gravity. And once you look at the blurb sheet and you analyze your Scantron results PDF, you can maybe see a pattern. And then for the final exam, this will help you study and prepare to get correct on the final, at least the area that you biffed up on exam one. All right, so this, so your Scantron PDF, your results PDF, and the blurb sheet make a nice little mini study guide for you. And matter of fact, if you ace the, the Scantron, you can still, you know, look at the, the blurb sheet. It's, you know, it's a little, kind of a little study guide, except for the matching. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't give a blurb for the matching. But uh, anyway, so that's going to be in web courses. Let me show you exactly what it's, it looks like. Uh, I'll post that uh, on this page uh, with the Cheetos icon. So like... Here in the first row, or the second row actually, uh, right now it's TBA, but I'll, I'll put some uh, blurbs in there mm, this afternoon maybe. I gotta scan them into PDF myself. I printed them out on the printer and used them to make the answer keys. And now I'm gonna give them to you, at, but I have to scan it first and then put them in web courses and stuff. But this is where you'll find them and I'll announce it. You know, and you, you know, it's not like you need it for Thursday or anything like that. There's no deadline, just the final exam, because uh, they're helpful for studying for the final. All right. Now, let me pause for questions. Sidora. The final, ex uh, Sidora asked, is the final exam cumulative? The answer to that is yes. So, this is good, a good, nice, a nice little study tool. You know, you don't want to only use this, but yeah, you, if you want to use as many tools as possible, yeah, you do want to try to grab this. Question, Winfield. Uh -huh. Yes, the, the study, the blurb sheet, and your Scantron results PDF together make a nice little study guide for the final. Because we're not, you know, we're not going to be, well, the midterms are not technically cumulative, but it's not like we're going to stop talking about F equals MA. You know, we're going to be talking about F, F equals MA all the way till December, but, but, uh, but for the final, yes, the final is cumulative, so these are good study tools. Question here. No, but you know what I can do with the I, The question was, is the blurb sheet going to include the eye clicker questions? No, it doesn't. That's, a, that's actually, I could do a separate blurb sheet for that. But you know what I should do? I should do a talking PDF uh, for the eye clicker questions. That would be even better. 
than just having the answers. Because those are calculations, and I think that would, you know. And you know what? I found that the brain burner, the second eye clicker question, uh, burned a lot of people's brains in this section and the other section. I could see people that were, they were working on it, and they were, you know, they had these answers over here, the correct answer being over here, uh, they're pretty far away, but I could, I could kind of distinguish patterns. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, difficulty on that one. So I think a talking PDF would be the blurb sheet for the clicking questions. Um, yes, in blue. Midterm? A midterm exam? We have those in this class? Wait a minute. What are you talking? You're talking about midterm exams. Uh, do we have any of those in this class? You mean, you mean the stuff on the syllabus that says midterm exams, for which we've had since the first day of class? Yes, of course we're going to have them. The next one is October sixteenth. And the one after that is November 20th as the syllabus. So, yes. Uh, and then the final uh, for this class, you guys have the 4th, I think, December 4th. Is that right? Okay. You guys go first. And then the, the 9 a.m. section has it on Thursday. You guys have it on Tuesday. So you guys are right out of the box. But you know what? Those other guys have a 7 a.m. final. So even though you guys go earlier, you start at 10 in the morning. Uh, another question. Okay, um, let me ask you a question. This is kind of off topic, but it's, it's worth mentioning. Raise your hand if you're an education major. Elementary, early childhood, secondary, anything like that. Great. You guys are awesome. You're at the top of my list. Now, let me t tell you why I asked that question. You guys that are elementary, secondary, early childhood, Eventually, you're going to be teaching. And teaching is a lot of fun. It's, it's just, I, you know, I love teaching. I love teaching here at UCF. And one of the things that I do, one of the things that you're going to learn, and you're going to, it's going to be your bread and butter, is questions, asking students questions. Just like I ask you guys questions. And so one of my questioning techniques is called the 15-second rule. Now, for those of you that, you know, a lot of you will be, become leaders of some kind, not just teachers. And if you're a leader leading a meeting uh, of other people, you'll also want to know the 15-second rule. And the 15-second rule is if you're with a group and you want to stop for questions then ask the group for questions and wait 15 seconds. And usually by the end of the 15 seconds, um, somebody will speak up. It sometimes takes 15 seconds or, you know, like the, the first lecture today, uh, one of the guys that sits over on the aisle here, he, he asks a question at the 14th second. All right, so now I'm going to time 15 seconds for you here. I'm going to ask for questions one more time, and I'm going to wait 15 seconds. Here we go. Anybody have any questions? Starting now. That's 15 seconds. Seems like forever, but it works. 
So you guys that are teachers in the future, uh, you guys that will be running meetings, hopefully the BOSS uh, of your small group or your big group, 15-second rule. All right, let's review some homework uh, and get your clicker ready. We're going to uh, review the homework, two homework items, just to reinforce momentum concepts, impulse concepts, um, and then we're going to do a clicker question, and you're going to do the calculation, very similar to the, the second one that we review. Now, the first one that we're going to go over is the skateboard interaction. And that we had, I think, three questions in a row. First two were multiple choice concepts, and the third one was actually calculating a momentum. It was a momentum exchange problem. And then the second one that we're going to review is the medicine ball in space, you know, with a picture of Wile E. Coyote and stuff like that. All right, so we're going to review those right now. Um, and let's uh, start with skateboarders. Uh, this is the main concept. In the skateboard interaction, uh, who did we have doing skateboard? Rachel uh, and, and Sawyer, uh, right? Rachel, where's... Rachel, where are you at? She's she's looking. No, the other Rachel. Oh, that would be you. Okay. Anyways, uh, so those guys did the, you know, they, they exchanged momenta, all right? And that's the thing that you want to remember on this. You know, Sir Isaac Newton's third law, the law of equal but opposite reaction. He was thinking momentum. Because the delta P of Sawyer is equal but opposite in direction to the delta P of um, the other uh, Rachel. All right? And so, and, and, and you guys, every single interaction in the universe can be understood with some version of the skateboard interaction. That's it. Gravitational interaction, exchange of momenta. Nuclear reactions, exchange of momenta and energy. And we'll study energy later this week. So let's get down to the business uh, with the skateboard problem. Now, the, uh, the skateboard specs were given for Raymond. All right? In 0.2 seconds in this example... Uh, the, I th and I believe the elapsed time was different for each, for each instance that you took, for each attempt. Uh, he traveled 1.05 meters. Now, what that lets you do is figure out his average speed. All right? And so the amount of uh, momentum that he got from interacting with Gregory in the homework uh, depends on knowing his average speed. So here we go. Uh, it's just 1.05 divided by 0 0.2. Now, go ahead and verify me on that. Uh, that should work out to 0, excuse me, uh, V equals, and this is V2, uh, V equals uh, 5.25 meters per second. Anybody verify me on that? Good. Anybody over here verify? Always bring your calculator so you can verify me because every once in a while, you might catch me napping. In other words, I have a typo in there because I'm, I'm typing something and, and somebody calls on my phone or, or somebody brings me some Chick-fil-A and that totally distracts me and I type in the wrong number and so you, sometimes you catch me napping. Anybody over here verify? 5.25, you got it? Okay. All right. And I want you to think, you know, you got to verify me every step of the way. Do not let me get away with anything. Trust but verify. All right, so the average speed for Raymond, 5.25. Now, that means that after the interaction, his momentum is leftward uh, mass times speed. All right, so speed is 5.25. His mass is 75 kilograms, and that's given in the problem. 
So P is equal to MV. And now in this one, instead of using the word leftward that I use in uh, 1D, uh, I'm in the equation, I'm going to write down negative 5.25 to symbolize or to signify leftward motion. All right. And so you calculate that out. Uh, who's got... Uh, negative 393, anybody verify me on that? Who's, is this the slacker side over here on the right? I don't see anybody verify me except for you. And I don't even know if you're really very, is he, is he, is he? Okay, the, okay, you guys, because you, you look a little bit shaky over there. Okay, good. All right, so negative 393.75. So in, in this problem, uh, the answer I asked for to the nearest tenth of a kilogram meter per second. So that, that, go, uh, that would round up to negative 393.8. All right. Now, that's, that's what Raymond gets. All right. And Gregory, now Raymond's getting negative 393.8 in this direction. Okay. That's nice. So that means that Gregory is getting 393.8 in this direction. Ching. So that's, what, that's the answer, 393.8 for this example. Now, if you have four attempts, you're going to have at least one number different on each attempt randomly. All right, so you've got to read carefully. Matter of fact, a student came up after uh, the 9 o'clock lecture and said, Dr. B, I was doing those, the wheel problem. I couldn't get the wheel problem. I got everything else but the, the last wheel problem with a really small angle. And I went and looked at her stuff, and she had tried to reuse um, an angle from the earlier attempt. And so you can't do that. So read carefully. Uh, and, and there's always at least one factor that's changed randomly on each attempt. Okay, let me pause for questions for 15 seconds. See, it works almost all the time. P stands for momentum. And hey, you guys, we're going to use the symbol P for uh, pressure in a few weeks. And so when we do that, you got to be alert to the context. You know, so if you're talking about heating and stuff, gases, pressure, you're probably going to talking about p pressure not p momentum so that's a couple weeks away another question yes yep yeah, mm -hmm. that's right this minus sign here in the third equation block let me get my cursor over here this minus sign in the third equation block signifies mathematically the concept of direction to the left. Now, in the sentence, 1D, that's a sentence, I use the word leftward. And the variation that I could have done down here uh, in the third equation block is write in positive 75, positive 5.25, comma, and then the word leftward. And that would have been kosher. But I decided to use the minus sign, and that's, that's good. All right. Now let's uh, continue to the second problem, the medicine ball problem, um, with Wiley e. Coyote. Uh, and uh, hey, you guys, the the big thing is on this one: stopping time. Use impulse formula. Your first impulse when you read the word stopping time or something equivalent to that is. I must use the impulse formula as the cinchiest method, hopefully. Now, sometimes it's set up the, the impulse formula is not that ho helpful, but a lot of times it is. So always start with that. And that's, what it, that's up there at the top, F delta T equals delta P. And uh, let me get Mr. Coyote out of the way. So um, the problem is there's a medicine ball floating in space at a certain velocity, 
subject to a tractor beam giving a certain amount of force, uh, in this example, 1.6 newtons uh, to the south. And the, the uh, medicine ball is traveling at a certain speed to the north. In this example, 6 meters per second to the north. So there's the diagram uh, with a force opposite direction to the velocity vector. That's the initial velocity, v, V1. Now V2 is zero because it stopped. It's a stopping problem. The question is, how long does it take to stop this baby? Now, how long it takes, that's up here in the uh, impulse formula at the top of the page, delta T. That's the stopping time. So if we could figure out the delta P on the right-hand side of that, and then we just got the F, that's 1.6 newtons. And hey, you guys, we got to put a minus sign on that one because that's a leftward, or no, we're going to define south being to the left. So south is a negative, and Desiree, uh, north is to the right, so that's going to be positive, okay, in this problem, all right? So we're going to use that, and we're going to figure out delta T. Now, here's a tip. Um, delta T is an amount of time that you t it takes for the tractor beam to bring it to a stop. It's going to be a positive number, all right? So if I, if I get any minus signs, they, be I, I be they better cancel out, all right? So we've got to be alert for that. All right, because, you know, like negative times negative is positive. So hopefully, or negative divided by negative is, is positive. So hopefully we'll get something like that. All right, now, uh, V2 is zero. Um, so delta V, here it is, 0, 0.0 meters per second. It's always later minus earlier, V2 minus V1, VF minus VI, however you phrase it. Uh, so it's 0.0, .0 meters per second minus 6 meters per second. All right. And so the delta V is negative 6 meters per second. And that's going to go into delta P. Okay, Laura. So delta P, remember, it's MV. P is MV. And so delta P is M times delta V, because we're doing it without any change in the, no delta M, All right? So we're just doing M times delta V. So that's, that's right here. And hey, you guys, in this example, the mass of the medicine ball was 1.34 kilograms. And I didn't list it up at the first part of the outline, but you can you know, make a note or put a star next to it. Yeah, the mass of the medicine ball, 1.34. And I think that changes on each uh, attempt as well. I'm not sure, but I think that's one of the factors that changes. So mass times delta V, 1.34 times negative 6. And here my minus sign is due. So my, my delta P is negatory. It's leftward. I've gotten, this ball has gotten some leftward southward delta P. You know what that means? What part of the system, what part of this problem got some northward delta P? What do you think? Who exerted a force on the Medicine ball. Was it Chuck Norris? No. Was it Justin Bieber? No. It was a spaceship. So the, the equal but opposite reaction is a northward delta P on the spaceship. Now, the spaceship's not going to, you know, show it that much because, you know, a spaceship is pretty big compared to a medicine ball, a lot of kilograms. But theoretically, it got some northward uh, delta P. But we're figuring out the, the specs here for the, the medicine ball. Let's stick to it. Uh, now, we've got to the point now where we can figure out the impulse form, or we can put stuff into the impulse equation. All right? 
So we've got F. We already have F. That's 1.6. And it's going to be negatory. All right. And I've got delta P, that's negative 8.04. And hey, you guys, your, your, your clicker question coming up in just a minute, it, you're going to do a calculation on this very same one. So write down the mass and the, the V1 and V2, and uh, you're going to have a different tractor beam. This is the high-quality Acme tractor beam. And we're going to use brand X, a little bit weaker, on your first clicker question. All right, so make sure you have this all written down. All right, so now you just plug stuff in. Here we go. F, negative 1.6 newtons, all right, let, uh, southward over here, so negative 1.6. And delta T, that's what we're trying to figure out. That's my stopping time. And then negative 8.04. Uh, by the way, it, does anybody verify me on that 8.04? You got it? Good? Okay. 8.04, uh, and it's negatory as well because delta P is or delta V, the change in the velocity is is negative. So delta P is negative 8.04 kilogram meters per second, uh, and now you want to clear the left side, get delta T by itself, and. Those of you that may be thinking, Dr. B, why are you going so slow? Why are you going through every step? Uh, if you're thinking that, it's because you've had a, lo a little bit more math than maybe some of the other people in here. We have a, a huge range in math skills and math experience in a class like this. So I'm, I'm trying to go step by step and just line things out so that everybody can you know, just keep up and get a good handle on this. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, clear, and that's divide both sides by negative 1.6 newtons. Now remember, <clears throat> kilogram meter per second for momentum in the numerator, and down in the denominator, it's kilogram meter per second squared. And so every the kilograms cancel top and bottom. The meters cancel top and bottom, and per second cancels top and bottom, but the bottom still has one unit of per second. So that goes to the top as a regular second in the numerator. So your answer is, uh, anybody verify me on that, 5.025? Okay, good. Okay, and it's seconds, all right? And in this one, the, um, the round off was to the nearest hundredth of a second. Now you're going to do a clicker question in just, just a minute. And you're going to round off. So, and you're going to use the same uh, medicine ball, different tractor beam. So you're going to have to calculate a stopping time. So let me pause for questions in case you want me to review something. Yes. Yeah, and I would, if I, if I did that on a test, I would probably um, tell you, use minus signs to denote south. You know, and it, it especially, it's not that important if it's like a multiple choice question, a concepts question. But if I was to give it to you as an eye clicker question, I'll always tell you, you know, leftward or southward or downward. Um, use a minus sign and you know because I you know how I always say uh, round off to the nearest you know whatever and then type in and hit the send key you know and, and it'll be in there if if it's needed okay because I always know when I, when I write those questions for the exam or for class I always know the answer and where I want you to round it off and it's always I always spell that out so that you don't have to you know fool around another question Okay. Uh, 
Um, this one's going to be a numeric question. Check your Go Nitro. Here it is. Same medicine ball, same initial speed. Different tractor beam, a little smaller, 1.1 newtons. And st south. Calculate the new stopping. Uh, is it going to be bigger or smaller than five? Bigger or smaller than five seconds? More time or less time to stop? Think that over. Calculate your answer and see if it makes sense. Smaller stopping force. The Brand X tractor beam. Let me see what you guys are answering. Make sure you round off carefully. Nearest 0 0.01 seconds. Nearest hundredth of a second. Okay, good. You guys all the way in the back over there? You getting uh, Go Nitro back there? Okay. Good. How about you guys back in this corner? You guys getting Go Nitro? Okay. Uh, careful with the minus sign. Supposed to be a positive answer. A negative answer would be going backwards in time. I wonder how that would work out. Stopping before the tractor, be so many seconds before they turn on the tractor beam. That wouldn't work. Who won the game last night? The steel. Oh, they finally won a game? Same record as the Browns. And the Cheatriots got beaten Sunday. What's that guy's name? Tom Brady. Tom Crybaby, always crying to the refs. All right, uh, 30 seconds. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Come on, one more. Good. Uh, okay, good. One hundred ninety-two of you. They're very good. Um, students, raise your hand if you got. 7.31, sweet, all right. 
So, uh, you know what that tells me? You're learning. I got you right where I want you. All right. Let's go back to universal gravitation. We talked just a bit about it uh, on uh, Thursday last week. And what I want you to be doing reading-wise is uh, chapter 3, finish that. And I think we'll talk about gravitation a little bit more on... Actually, we'll talk about it here and there for the rest of the semester. But we'll probably talk a little bit more about it on uh, Thursday. But let's get started with it. Uh, And what we're going to do is put together Sir Isaac Newton's ideas about centripetal acceleration and centripetal force with his theory of universal gravitation. Right? So that's going to be the new information, universal gravitation. Now remember, except the, as we talked about Thursday, centripetal acceleration, V squared over R. Centripetal force, M V squared over R, because F equals MA. All right? So that's, now that holds for any, you know, for a merry-go-round, a Ferris wheel, or a planet in space, the moon orbiting the Earth. All right, now the moon's not on a perfectly circular orbit, but it's pretty close. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna act as if the moon uh, is on a circular orbit. Now, Sir Isaac Newton made this uh, hypothesis, and he encoded it into an equation that there were two physical factors two measurables, and only two. The mass of the two objects that are interacting, you know, so the moon and the earth, the mass of the moon, the mass of the earth, and then the distance that they are apart. So that's center to center. Make a note of that. It's not in the, in the, in the screen here, but center to center distance. So something like a planet, you go from the center of the planet to the center of the other planet, or the center of the planet to the center of the moon or the center of the sun to the center of a planet, because the sun, you know, keeps the planets on orbit gravitationally as well. The center of the sun to the center of a comet, center of the sun to the center of an asteroid. An an asteroid, and actually, for an asteroid, you should say, and comets, they're irregularly shaped, so you should say the center of mass. The center of mass of a sphere is just the center. But for something that's shaped like an asteroid or a comet, it might be like shaped like a potato, but it'll still have a center of mass somewhere, and that's where all these uh, distances are measured. So he said this, that the more mass you have, the more gravitational force. Now, if you've ever looked at the uh, uh, film from the Apollo space, the Apollo moon program, the astronauts on the moon, those guys could really jump around like Michael, better than Michael Jordan. And they were wearing those big heavy space suits, you know, with the oxygen packs and everything. And they could still leap like, like a deer because the surface of the moon, gravity is much weaker. It's, the mass of the moon is much weaker. And also um, it's, the distance and the mass combine to a, a fairly weak surface gravity. So the more mass, the more force. But the more distance, the weaker the force. So anything that has to do with the mass is going to be up in the numerator somewhere. You know, because the more mass and the, the more in the numerator, the bigger your f- fraction is. But if But if you have something big in the denominator, that'll make your entire quotient smaller. So we're looking for distance down in the denominator. All right? And this is is the formula that he put together. Now, nobody knows if if he experimented mathematically, you know, like a few notebook papers full of scratch paper uh, with some other formula. But this is the one uh, that he decided was righteous. And it's simply this, that the force of gravity is the product of some constant of proportionality, g, times the mass of one object, times the mass of the other object, mass one, mass two, 
up in the denominator and then down in the denominator, not r, the distance between them, but r squared. This is an r, an inverse r squared force. Okay. And uh, now I want to mention the constant g, capital G. Now it's actually related to our lowercase g, 9.8 meters per second squared. And I'll show you that in a minute. But capital G is known as Newton's constant. It's also known as the gravitational constant, capital G. Now, in his day, Sir Isaac Newton did not measure the value of G, but people started working on it pretty soon after his passing. It is a constant of proportionality from which you convert the two measurables, the two measurables being in the numerator, kilograms times kilograms, so kilograms squared in the numerator, and in the denominator, meters squared. And G multiplies those two and converts them into Newtons, kilogram meter per second squared. Let me repeat that. G is a conversion constant, a conversion factor, to convert kilograms squared divided by meters squared into Newtons. And Newtons being kilogram meter per second squared. Now, one way to think about this is um, like when you're converting, the, the example I like to cite is converting fr from uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius, which I hate. And we're not going to do any of that in this class. But if you remember from like sixth grade or, or ninth grade or science class or wh wherever you learned it, uh, there's like a factor of five ninths or nine fifths, depending if you're going from Celsius to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to Celsius. And then you got to add 32 and you got to subtract 32. And so that factor of nine fifths, five ninths, is a conversion factor. Celsius to Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit to Celsius. So let's see, Fahrenheit to Celsius would be nine fifths. No. Fahrenheit to Celsius would be 5 ninths. And Celsius to Fahrenheit would be 9 fifths. You know, just the flip-flop. And so what this factor, this factor G, and it has a value, you can look it up on the internets. And it's actually in the textbook. A couple places. Uh, it's like 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared which apparently I have now memorized that. But you don't have to worry about memorizing it, and you're not going to calculate with it. But do remember that that's what it's there for. Newton introduced it so that he would have a force instead of a ratio of kilogram squared to meter squared. Because this stuff here, if you just take the m's, that's kilogram squared in the numerator. And if you just take the square of the distance, that's meter squared in the denominator. That's not a Newton. So capital G converts that into Newtons. Second, and this is something that you won't necessarily see in a lot of physical science textbooks, but in mine you do. Capital G is also important in Einstein's theory of relativity because it sets the... scale the distance scale for the event, for instance, for the event horizon around a black hole. A black hole is an object whose gravity is so intense, the curvature is so intense, the gravitational curvature of space time is so intense that even light cannot escape. Escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. And so the event horizon is the point of no return. If you cross inside the event horizon, you ain't going to escape. If you're outside the event horizon and you have a good rocket ship, yeah, you can get away. You just got to fire for all you can. And theoretically, you can get away. But once you cross the event, event horizon, you're toast. And that's why they call it a black hole, because nothing escapes it. And capital G 
And the mass of the black hole, the mass of the star that formed the black hole, we think that black holes form when uh, supernova explosions occurs, if it's a big enough star. Supernova explosion occurs, it collapses into a black hole of a certain mass. And capital G, the mass of the star and the speed of light. Those are the three factors that control the size of the event horizon for a black hole. So capital G is actually pretty important in the theory of relativity as well. It's not just, it's not only a conversion factor. But that's what Sir Isaac Newton uh, was able to do. Now, a couple things I want to mention to you is uh, concerning the inverse R squared force. Go ahead and write down that phrase, inverse R squared force. Uh, it's, it's been well verified. We, we use, you know, NASA uses, you know, the theory of relativity. You know, the GPS system is, is undoable without the theory of relativity. But for getting, to, to lob something from Earth to the moon, uh, this, this force law is fine. To lob something from Earth to the moon and have it land on a dime, which we can now do, uh, you need the relativity. But uh, this one is, is very good. It's been very well verified. And it's an inverse R squared force, which means, among other, other things, that it's infinite range. So go ahead and make a note of that. It's an infinite range force. That means that every galaxy in the universe is interacting gravitationally with the big toe on your right foot. And your little toe on your right foot is interacting with your big toe on your right foot. It's not a very strong interaction. You know the, big, the strongest interaction gravitationally? Your big toe, your little toe? No, they, they, don't inter, they interact, but not very strong. But you know the biggest inter, interaction with those things are? The Earth. Earth has a big interaction on your little toe, your big toe, every, every atom in your body. But theoretically, your big toe is interacting with the Andromeda galaxy and everything else. Here's another um, gravitational interaction, and it's not infinite range. It's finite range. Uh, Tides in the oceans of the earth. They're controlled by the moon. The moon is close enough to have a significant effect on the water. The moon also has a significant, uh, significant enough to be measured uh, effect on land. Land has tides. Now land is, you know, the, the crust of the earth is rigid. And fluid, water is very fluid, so it can move in response to the gravitational pull and tugging of, of the moon. The moon is close enough, we get gravitational interaction. Here's another interesting fact about the moon. The fact that the moon is always facing, or the same side of the moon is always facing the Earth. In other words, the spin rate of the moon is synchronized to its orbital rate. So the, no matter where you are on Earth, you're always looking at the same side of the moon. So, you know, we call it the dark side of the moon, but really we should call it the far side of the moon that you can never see from the surface of the Earth. I mean, we can see it from spacecraft that we send looping around. You know, like the Apollo astronauts, you know, they looped around the moon and stuff. They could map everything out. The Russians did the same. Uh, but that is a gravitational, they call it gravitational locking. You know, the locks the, the orbit and the, the orbital rate and the um, spin rate together. And we've seen it in other moons in the, in the uh, solar system, you know, like moons of Jupiter and moons of uh, Saturn and stuff like that. Another thing, tides, tidal, tidal locking, tides. The moon, yeah, the moon. Significant land tides, ocean tides. The sun also um, produces a measurable but smaller 
tidal effect in the oceans of Earth. Now, right now, if you, if you got up early this morning, and I know many of you students love to get up early, and <laughs> before sunup, like me, the, the moon was going down in the west just before sunup. Now, what that means is that they're on opposite sides of the Earth. Full moon sets when the sun rises. Full moon rises when the sun sets. Uh, half moon, no. But full moon, yeah, they're, they're opposite sides of the Earth. And, when, and so right now we're in that position. And what that means is that we have tidal forces significant from the sun and from the moon, and they're acting in concert. You know, they're, they're both acting away from the center of the Earth. So we have extra deep low tides right about now and extra high high tides. Actually, anybody here been surfing last day or two? Yeah? Is, is it, is the, do you go surfing at high tide? I mean, is that what you like to do? You don't? Is it too scary? Oh, okay. But it, so are, do you know that the tides right now are, the high tides are fairly good or? Oh, you surf in California? Well, dude, it's the same planet. It's just, it's a, it's just a few thousand miles away. When, when there's big tides here, there's big tides over there. They're not in sync, but you know. Anyway, so theoretically, when the Earth and the moon, when the when the Earth and the moon, when you have a new moon. Okay, so that means the the moon and the sun are on the same side of Earth. Same thing. You have big, you have high tide, extra high high tides, extra deep low tides. All kinds of things about gravity. Now, another thing about gravity is it, it's essential for understanding satellites and the orbits that they take. Now, the planets are satellites of the sun. The moon is a satellite of the earth. The rings of Saturn are zillions of little satellites that form a ring around Saturn. All right. Now, what we're going to do is talk about the law of gravity and centripetal force for a fairly simple system, the Earth and a satellite. The mass of the Earth being capital M, the satellite mass being M subscript S. And, you know, it, w the way that works, you set the distance and then NASA designs the orbit and the rockets to get you to the orbit, you know, like in Hidden Figures, and, uh, and, you know, they, they get you up there, hopefully, if they know what they're doing. So here's an example. And we're going to just assume circular orbits for simplicity. And you can do all this with elliptical orbits, but to do that, you have to use a lot of calculus and trig. So we're going to stick to circular because then we don't have to use any fancy trig or, or calculus. Now, there's a lot of calculus behind all this stuff. So let's think about the centripetal force. Anything that's on a circular path has to have a centripetal force. All right? And so a merry-go-round, you can't make a merry-go-round out of water. You've got to have some pullback towards the center of the merry-go-round. All right? Ferris wheel, the same. You can't be, build a Ferris wheel out of jello. It's got to have some rigidity to keep the circular shape. And it's going to spin around the axis of the Ferris wheel. Who's been on that big Ferris wheel down by the attractions? Anybody? I, I want to go up on that one of these days. Is it cool or what? It's pretty nice. It's pretty big. I mean, that's for sure. So here's what we got. If gravity is your force, here's your MA over here, centripetal force, Acceleration, V squared over R, that's your A, that's your acceleration. So this is MA over here on the right-hand side of this equation block. Question? No? You're stretching? Okay. And then here's your F, gravitational force. Yeah, you can make a circular orbit. Moon's not perfectly circular. Earth's not perfectly circular. But they're pretty close. So let's take a look at this. So here's your gravity, and here's your centripetal. 
So the centrip centripetal formula is good on any circular path. Nardo ring, merry-go-round, Ferris wheel, planet in space, moon in space. All right, now, let me dim those out. Anybody notice anything convenient, handy, or interesting about this equation? This is our synthesis. We've put together gravitation and centripetal force. Notice anything? Look at that equation. Anything handy, convenient, or special? I don't see any unicorns up there, so there's nothing special. What do you see up there that's nice? What do you see? Don't look at your phone. Look at the equation. Come on. What do you see? Yeah, you can get rid of one of the R's. Anything else? What? M subscript S. You can cancel that as well. Let's burn that one out. Ching. All right, and we're going to get rid of the R's here. So here's, here's with the MS, M subscript S, burned off. And see how this is getting a little bit simpler? Now let's do the R's. And I've got one R on the right in this second equation block and two factors of R, R squared, on the left side. All right, so there's the leftovers. Oh, and by the way, you guys, right here in this middle equation block, our terrestrial G, 9.8 meters per second, is this quotient, capital G, capital M, over R squared. If, for R, you put in the radius of the Earth, 6371 kilometers, the square it, and then the mass of the Earth in the numerator, and then Newton's constant in the numerator. You calculate that all out, and you get 9.8. And that's actually the acceleration at any elevation. So you could put an R, you could put 6,371 kilometers plus 500 kilometers and put that in the denominator and square it and everything. And you get the uh, acceleration at the level of the space station. It's 500 kilometers up above the surface. So it'll work at any altitude. Question? No, R is not 9.8. R is whatever you want. What I'm saying is that this quotient is G. 9.8 if you set R to 6,371 kilometers. So that's 6,371,000 ,000 meters. And then square it and then you know, calculate all that other stuff. It works out to 9.8. Because 6,371 kilometers is the surface radius of Earth, approximately. All right, so let's get this thing up here to the middle now. All right. And let's do a couple examples. Let's say that you know the radius r of the orbit that you want your satellite to travel. All right. And why would you, you know, why would you want to have a satellite at a certain uh, altitude, a certain distance from the center of the Earth, r? You know, I mean, but you know, if you if you do, if you know you want it at a certain distance, then you can figure out the required v. You know, look, just look at that formula. If I, if I say R equals uh, 7,000 kilometers, I can figure out V. If I, if I say I want V equal to uh, 2,000 meters per second, I can figure out R. You know, just plug it in and solve for R. 
Now, you might say to yourself, well, why would I want to know, why would I want to set the radius? Why would I want to set the altitude of a satellite? Well, how about if you're trying to keep an eye on the Ruskies? You know, we got a bunch of spy satellites, you know, and you want to get a good close look, you have a low Earth rate, a, a low Earth orbit, all right? And we got Buku uh, satellites up there looking down at the Russians. You know, we got a lot of stuff. You know, the Hubble Space Telescope. We got a bunch of copies of the Hubble Space Telescope looking down at the Russians too. But they, they don't tell you about that, but that's, we got it. What about if you need a certain orbital speed? Yeah, just plug in V and then figure out what your R is. Then get your satellite up to that orbit, up to that altitude, and you're good. Get that V, you know, set your rocket so the very last ounce of rocket fuel gets you to that altitude and that speed, and bing, you're good. Now here's an example of that. Here's a real satellite rocket man, uh, or I should say missile man, concept. How about if you want a satellite that's fast enough on orbit to orbit the Earth once per day? Is that a righteous satellite concept for NASA or anybody else? The answer to that is yes. If it's, if it's on an equatorial orbit, so if it's, if it's orbiting straight above the equator, for instance, and you know the Earth is spinning once per day. And if the satellite is orbiting once per day above the equator, then what that means is it, the, the equator, a point on, you know, there's, there's a point on the Earth's surface where you can look up and see the satellite and it's never going to change. Because it's, it's going around the Earth once every, and you're going around once every 24 hours. And that is what we call a geosynchronous satellite. If it's orbiting the, sat the equator, we would call it geostationary. And that is what our uh, communication satellites are, most of them. They're stationed over the equator at a certain elevation, a certain altitude, certain distance from the center of the Earth. And we try to keep them up there as long as we can. And we aim the, you know, our satellites, you know, Dish Network or DirecTV, uh, at the direction of that satellite. You know, so for us, our satellites, our communication satellites are going to be over, you know, somewhere over South America, like Brazil or something like that. Other people, you know, uh, you know, England is going to be the, the most efficient place for an for people in England is going to be somewhere over the coast of Africa. Actually, somewhere off the coast of uh, Zaire. You know, the, where, the, where the equator is in Africa. Uh, so China, they've got stuff, you know, all the people in China, their communication satellites are going to be right over the equator as it goes through like Indonesia. And it's directly south of China. All right, let's go through a, a few more things here about the law of universal gravitation, the inverse R squared force. I've already told you that it's infinite range. Another thing is that the gravitational force, GM1, M2 over R squared, helped Sir Isaac Newton and Edmund Halley, his friend, figure out the laws of motion for the planets. Now, about 50 years or so before Sir Isaac Newton, in the days of Galileo, there was another scientist in Europe, an astronomer named Johannes Kepler. And he studied zillions of astronomical position measurements. He didn't have a telescope, so those were all naked eye measurements. And he found that Mars actually has a slightly elliptical orbit. And actually all the planets are ellipses. So that was his first law of planetary motion. The planets orbit with an ellipse. And Mars is the most elliptical of the planets. 
Another, another thing that he found, found was that, was that if, if, if you take, take the ellipse, the ellipse and, then the and then the sun, sun is over, is over here, here at one of the focus, focus points of the ellipse, ellipse um, um, then, then if you if form, you form uh, these, these, you know, every, every um, um, time, time period, T, T if you if form a wedge, a wedge, 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 the wedges all change shape. But the, but the if, if if their if boundaries, boundaries are, are so, so this was so going around around uh, counterclockwise. Here's one, one o'clock or one one, one, one time, period, time period, two time two periods, three time periods, 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 and all around here, here for thirteen time periods period before it gets back to back zero. To zero um, all those all pi those wedges, wedges, they're different shapes, shapes, they're the same amount of area. And Kepler figured that out. It's amazing what he figured out. And then the and third one that he figured out was that the orbital period and the orbital size, average orbital size, are proportional. Now, here's the fancy version of it down here. Go ahead and write this one down. P squared, that's the orbital period. It's equal to the big square bracket, a bunch of constants. You see Newton's gravitational constant in there in the denominator. The mass one and mass two of the two objects that are orbiting. So the planet and the sun. Or um, a black hole and another star. Most of the stars that we see in the galaxy are in binary star systems. This is how we measure it. We figure out M1 and M2 by using uh, Kepler's third law. And A to the third power, that's the average orbital distance. The fancy term for that is the semi-major axis. Now, Kepler figured out those laws, and what Newton and Halley said was, if gm1 m2 over r squared is true, then all those three laws have to be true. Kepler saw it in the numbers. He saw it in the spreadsheets. Sir Isaac Newton proved it using calculus and trig. So what Halley did was he said, all right, Sir Isaac, if this is really true for planets, how about comets? And so what Halley did was he, he made a study of um, comets. And he said, they're, they're going to, if they're on an ellipse, they're going to come back periodically. And, and most of the comets are on elliptical, noticeably elliptical orbits. All right? So he had studied a lot of comets. And Sir Isaac Newton, you know, a lot of people were studying comets. And he predicted, he said, look, we had one in 1531. Those were the days when Cortez was uh, landing in, in Mexico. He said, we had one in 1607. Those are the days of Shakespeare. 1682. Those are the days of Halley and Newton. And he said, those comets are the same comet. And they're, it's going to return in 1758. And Halley predicted it, and by God it did. It came back Christmas time in 1958. And that is a huge verification of the law of universal gravitation, as you can read in the textbook. Okay, look for some homework tonight. Two assignments, both small. You're dismissed.